We would like to go ahead and get started with this morning's session. And first of all, let me welcome you to the Coleman Government Center, particularly for those of you may, who maybe have not had the opportunity to uh, enjoy our newest city facility yet. It's a pretty awesome building. And, and if you have a chance to walk around after the session, please feel free to do so. I have been asking for my office to be moved over here, but I, I haven't seen any paperwork come across my desk yet for that to happen. But it's a really great building and we're happy to host you here this morning. My name is Dawn Tyler Lee and I have the honor of serving as Deputy Chief of Staff of External Affairs in the Office of Mayor Andrew J. Ginther. And I am also one of the Rose Fellows for the Columbus team. Mayor Ginther will be joining us shortly, but we wanted to get started with today's program. I'm very excited about the week that we've had. Uh, we started the Rose Fellowship back in October and I probably shouldn't admit this, but I wasn't quite sure what it was and what we would be doing, but uh, the, the sessions that we've had uh, since October have been really eye-opening and inspiring and the opportunity to bring together experts from across this country that are here to give their recommendations and insight and feedback about our community and how we can make it even better and even stronger has been invaluable. So I just want to offer some thank yous uh, before I turn it over to the Rose Center staff. I'd like to acknowledge Jess, Zimbabwe, Gideon, and Carrie, who are the team who come in from the Rose Center and make all of this magic happen. They have been wonderful resources. We have a team of visiting panelists who you'll hear a little bit more about later, but I'd like to acknowledge our co-leads for the visiting panel, Antoine Bryant and Lev Gershman, who have volunteered their time uh, to really be part of this work with us. And we hope that all of our visiting panelists have enjoyed their time here in Columbus, despite the lower temperatures than normal. <laughs> but we did order up some sun for yesterday, so I'm happy about that. The City of Columbus Fellows, fellows Team, Director Steve Shoney, Brent Sobchak, um, and Mayor Ginther make up our local team. And then I would not uh, be doing my job correctly if I didn't thank Mark Dravillis, our project manager, who has dotted every and crossed every T uh, for this experience. We have a number of local participants who have been without, with us throughout the week and also our numerous community partners, including developers, our nonprofit community, our neighborhood leaders, and the insight that you all have provided, I know have made the recommendations that our team will make today even more rich, so thank you for that. I'd like to also acknowledge staff from the Department of Development who's been with us every step of the way, Hannah Jones, Kevin Wheeler, and Mark Lundeen. So it's truly been a team effort. We're excited to hear the recommendations from the panel and look forward to a very robust session this morning. So with that, thank you to everyone for being here and I'd like to turn it over to Jess and Bobwe. Thank you, Don, and really thank you to the entire Columbus team um, and everyone who's listed on this slide from the city of Columbus, from ULI Columbus. We couldn't come in and you know put our feet up on your coffee table uh, and pretend to give you advice as outsiders without a lot of work going into that, and we really appreciate that, and also how hospitable you guys have been despite the cold weather. <laughs> So we are here in Columbus uh, to look at the question of creating mixed income neighborhoods uh, in, the, in the city. And we're here as a part of the Daniel Rose Center, which was founded by this gentleman, Daniel Rose, who's a real estate developer out of New York, but also did projects around the country, Pentagon City outside of DC, one financial center in Boston. Um, and in his career in real estate, Mr. Rose realized that it was only possible because he had sophisticated partners sitting on the other side of the table representing the cities. And so he wanted to create a space for that conversation to happen about shared goals for our cities between the public and the private sectors. So that's what we endeavor to do at the Rose Center. We sort of have two parents. Uh, the Rose Center is a joint program of two nonprofit organizations. One is the National League of Cities, uh, which is a, a national organization, nonprofit based out of Washington, D.C., that acts as a resource and an advocate on behalf of 19,000 cities, towns, and villages across the country. Uh, we work closely with our state partners here, the Ohio Municipal League, which you may be familiar with. 
And the other organization is the Urban Land Institute, which is uh, another nonprofit also based out of Washington, D.C. Uh, and the Urban Land Institute is supported by some 40,000 individual members who committed themselves to a mission of the sustainable use of urban land and building thriving communities around the world. And they represent all the professions that go into real estate and land use. And so those two organizations come together. So we like to say that we bring the expertise of the largely private sector ULI membership into the service of the problems that cities are facing and their leaders and try to be supportive of those. So the Rose Center does a number of different programs throughout the year. We do a lot of educational programs for public officials, uh, scholarships to get them engaged in the Urban Land Institute and at the National League of Cities in high levels. But we also do this program, which is our flagship program. We're here as a part of the Daniel Rose Fellowship. This is our ninth year of operating the fellowship. And each year we invite four cities. We invite the mayor to become a fellow. And the mayor names three people from his or her senior land use team to also be fellows. And then we work with that cohort of 16 people for a year long program of leadership development and technical assistance on a particular challenge in their community. And then also peer to peer learning. We find that cities have too few opportunities to learn best practices from each other. Um, so this is a photograph of one we worked in Honolulu, and I include this one just to show you that even in paradise, the public agency meeting rooms and public sector uh, snacks at meetings are all lousy. So <laughs> don't feel bad about anything that, you, that you've, you've ever been a part of here. Uh, so in the first eight years of the program, these were the cities that we worked with all around the country. And this year, uh, Columbus is joined in the program by the cities of Richmond, Virginia, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Tucson, Arizona. And we have representatives from each of those cities here as a part of the visiting panel, providing a real grounded peer expertise from other city governments as a part of the panel of experts that we've assembled. Uh, we are here as a part of what we call a peer exchange panel visit because we have peers and experts in from around the country. And we've assembled a team of 12 national experts to look at the land use challenges the Columbus team has set forth. So we've been here for three days. Uh, we met with many of you in some stakeholder interviews. We got a tour of the study area that the city has defined. And this engagement falls about one third of the way into that year long engagement. So you'll see this towards the end of the presentation, but the next step is that all four of the cities are coming together in about a month to report back to each other about what they learned, what the experts told them when they came to their city, and what they've tried to accomplish. So we try to make it iterative and also keep, um, keep a goal in front of every team so that there's work moving on the project throughout the course of the year. This is the panel of experts that we have in town. So I will introduce them and then I'll introduce our co two co-chairs to kick off the panel's preliminary observations and initial recommendations. So our two co-chairs of today's panel are Antoine Bryant, who's with Moody Nolan out of Houston, Texas. Lev Gershman, who's with Tideline Partners out of San Diego, California. Christopher Coase, who's with LOCUS, a program of Smart Growth America out of Washington. Albert Elias, who's assist, Assistant City Manager in the City of Tucson, Arizona, and a Peer Rose Fellow from Tucson. Jane Ferreira, who's with the Department of Community and Economic Development in Richmond, Virginia, another Peer Fellow. Uh, Layla Finucan, who's with Victory Housing out of Rockville, Maryland. <clears throat> Elijah Herrick Blaine, who's a colleague of mine at the National League of Cities. Marty Jones, who's a real estate developer and uh, economic development strategist out of Boston, Massachusetts. Nick Norris, who's the planning director in Salt Lake City, and the, the third and final of your peer expert fellows from the other three cities. Christopher Steenan, who's with ACOM, an urban designer out of Brooklyn, New York. Harriet Tregoning, who's a community planning development resilience advisor out of Washington, DC. And Bo Gwallen, who's with Greenville, South Carolina, out of Blue Wall Real Estate. So thank you all for being here. It's a great to have such an engaged audience. It means a lot that you guys care this much about the project and about moving the city forward. And we look forward to working with you and talking to you, Antoine and Lev. Thank you, Jess, and good morning. Um, in full disclosure, we've been provided a tremendous amount of insight and information and, and have been uh, given a, a very uh, interesting challenge, a challenge that a lot of cities are facing across the country. So we were burning the midnight oil and, and three days of very intense stakeholder interviews. And the document is intended to be, this presentation is intended to be a living document. So we will cover at a high level, and this document will be available on the city website. So first, what is the challenge? And the challenge is, how can Columbus ensure its neighborhoods include housing and opportunity for economic mobility for a broad spectrum of people as the city continues to grow? 
This is the study area that, that's been provided uh, by staff just southeast of downtown. We'll get more into the geography of this area, but as downtown is experiencing a, uh, and the surrounding neighborhoods are experiencing growth, um, there is a tremendous opportunity to ensure that um, the rising tide lifts all boats. Um, we're going to go through some of these observations. There's, there's quite a bit. Uh, it, it, as, as Columbus experienced uh, sustained growth, uh, uh, the investment, the, the, the um, opportunity may not be equally distributed through the participants. Um, some parts of the city are still struggling uh, with divestment and vacancy as well as fear of di displacement. Um, real household incomes for many has lagged, resulting in, in growing income disparity. Uh, one of the interesting observations is that Columbus is a very auto-dependent city, and, and this may present opportunities, but also uh, potential disruption uh, for new technologies and innovations relating to transportation. The excellent thing is that the mayor and the staff are really thinking ahead uh, and are focused on creating mixed income neighborhoods that allow existing residents to benefit from improving quality of life and new amenities that development brings. Um, some of the other observation is that uh, the at-large city council uh, geography can result in some uh, neighborhoods feeling disconnected from city government and um, Col Columbus has an excellent history of collaborating and partnering. Uh, the Columbus way, but it has been focused uh, transactionally and we have some recommendations around that. Um, there is a unique opportunity uh, to leverage uh, this forward thinking uh, process and, and allow Columbus to serve as a model uh, for other U.S. cities how they can achieve inclusive growth and development. I'm going to hand it over to Antoine uh, to talk about some of the opportunities and challenges. Thank you, Lev. Uh, one of the things that we realized, what you heard from our my partner here, is that we have a lot of great opportunities in this city. This city is, has a lot going for it. We're very excited. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, earlier to be here a couple times since I just joined Woody Nolan, which is an architecture firm locally here, and was excited to see all the things that we have here in the wonderful city that you guys have. Uh, the opportunities that we noticed was that housing costs today are still relatively affordable, especially in considered against other cities uh, in the state. Are they increasing? Absolutely. But they still, uh, there is a context for people to be able to buy. It allows more cost-effective interventions to try to preserve affordability if we're very intentional about it on the front end. Uh, the proximity to downtown and other employment centers are and the growing strength in the adjacent markets make investment here likely in the very near future. It's going to continue to have investment here and so we want to be able to be ensure that that investment, everyone's able to take part in that investment. Uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital is an economic engine and a source of some of that investment. There are other community organizations such as Community Development for All People that are active in housing development and workforce training. Uh, there is some historical housing stock that is well maintained and attractive and the pedestrian scale of the street grid allow for uh, more walkable neighborhood development. So you can, there is an opportunity to have development at the pedestrian and at the neighborhood scale moving forward. And then the three corridors that we looked at have numerous development opportunity sites through traffic um, and through traffic to enhance the markets for commercial uses. We uh, spend a lot of time on Parsons, we spend a lot of time on Maine, we spend a lot of time on Livingston and we think uh, from a purely commercial and development standpoint, there are opportunities to grow there. Now, as in any opportunity, there are also going to be some challenges. And there are some challenges that we together can work through to be able to mitigate um, some of those challenges. Uh, there are a few accessible neighborhood serving <coughs> amenities and services, so we're going to have to direct more attention to that. Uh, some of the landlords are not investing in the upkeep of their properties, and so we're going to propose uh, some programs to be able to allow for that upkeep to uh, maintain. We realize, oh, welcome, Mayor. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, we welcome the opportunity, considering that our study area is 75% uh, made up of renters. Uh, it behooves us to pay some attention to that uh, maintenance of that. <laughs> Outstanding, sir. There we go. <laughs> Uh, additionally, um, there are visible signs of neglect and vacancy in both the public 
and private properties. And so we have to have an intentional efforts to be able to address those on both sides of it. There are low home ownership rates and income levels make residents potentially vulnerable to displacement when investment comes. Uh, we heard that loud and clear and we really spent some time on that because we know with that with any improvements in some communities there is a threat to displacement and we want to ensure that uh, we mitigate that as much as possible. Uh, Columbus is an outlier. Uh, the ease of eviction has a disproportionate impact on African American mothers. Uh, we realize and we've heard through data and from our mayor that the rate of eviction here and the ease of eviction here in Columbus mirrors that of New York City. And so we propose some ways to mitigate that so people are not pushed out of their homes as easily as they are here. Additionally, residents are coming and don't quite trust. Many of our residents don't quite trust the city, uh, are nervous about the expansion of the hospital, want to be much more of a part of this expansion and this growth. And quite frankly, I think we're all heartened by the presence here today. Uh, to see this many people at a public meeting with a bunch of goofy outsiders is very impressive at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. Uh, we, this is our, our basic contents, this basic outline of our presentation. As uh, my partner did note, that this presentation will be available online so that all the residents can review it shortly. But we're going to transition right now uh, to our partner here, Nick. We'll begin talking about inclusive planning and engagement. Thank you, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to quickly cover some of our observations about uh, the planning environment uh, and engagement environment that, that exists and some recommendations on um, or some things to consider on how, how to improve what's already happening. Um, the first thing that, that we recognized and noticed was a, a, a disconnect between the zoning and the goals. So the zoning doesn't seem to, to match these city goals. These two maps kind of demonstrate the difference. Um, the legend's hard to read, but you can tell that the different colors are, are signaling two different different things there. Then there's some things that are right. I mean, if you look on the primary corridors, Livingston Avenue and Parsons Avenue, um, there, there's some good, good opportunities in place already. Um, one of the benefits of aligning the zoning um, to the goals is that you, you, you help to build um, that capacity and predictability um, for all players. That includes the city planners, the decision makers, the community, and the development community. They all know what to expect. This helps streamline the approval process. It also, as a result, helps reduce the cost of development, particularly when it comes to housing. And so that's a big um, big plus to, to doing this, this approach. Um, the other key thing is equitable development must have a transparent and inclusive process. Uh, the picture here is uh, provided by, by Gideon is from Detroit and this is called the uh, movable desk. It's actually a public engagement opportunity outside of a coffee shop where the city staffs it and people come at their um, convenience to their neighborhood to provide feedback and give input to the city on whatever uh, matter it is. It's small scale, um, but highly successful. Um, Gideon tells me that people line up to, to participate um, when you're sitting outside of a coffee shop. And this is our experience, and I'm from Salt Lake City, and this is our experience as well, that when we go out to the community and have an engagement presence in the community, we get better results. Um, some of the key highlights uh, of this uh, process really com comes down to some of the um, land use processes that exist in the city. The, the variance process is a very reactionary and frankly out of date approach to, to development. It builds distrust in the community because nobody really knows what to expect and what the outcomes are. Um, the staff spends a lot of time being reactionary to, the, to these types of applications and they don't have the flexibility and the time to get out in front of development and growth trends and forecast those trends and help keep policies and, and regulations up to date and current. Um, this, one of the great things that Columbus has going on that's about to keep, I guess is in some 
form of process is the uh, corridor study that we've heard a lot about, and that is an opportunity to really put some of these engagement practices to work, um, being out in those corridors and making those things um, closer to the community and also trans making those processes transferable to future applications, not just only in the study area but citywide in other neighborhoods that, that need it as well. Uh, invest in partnerships. The study area has a number of um, partners and uh, community-based groups that um, really help bring the community together and and move the move the city forward towards meeting those, meeting those goals. But those, as mentioned earlier, those partnerships are somewhat transactional in nature, and and making making them more comprehensive comprehensive is is a uh, important approach to take to build those partnerships we have a big list of recommendations here um, we're, we're not going to go over all of them obviously but as was mentioned this is going to be available for um, everybody to, to read and digest um, the one that I wanted to really hit on was the update the zoning regulations to allow more by right development um, that matches the land use goals and re and depend less on the variance process. The variance process is important to have, um, but it, it should really be focused on those things that actually create some hardships and real difficulties uh, in the in the development process. That when you're writing a, a modern code, you cannot possibly come up with every potential um, issue that may arise. And particularly when you're looking at a neighborhood that developed decades ago, uh, and and maintaining that that compatibility through um, appropriate infill development is important. I think next is the housing and patient, so. Okay, um, good morning. Um, so housing, I guess it's sort of part of the main question for the land use challenge in general, but we thought it was worth it to build out a section just on, on that. Um, and then looking at the study area, we have a, a quote um, that we pulled, just first do no harm, and it's sort of just thinking of this area. One of the first things, um, before we get into the overall policy, I just want to point out just the existing number of units. Um, almost 9,000 existing units. Most of those, you can see the bulk, about 4,000 rental units um, owned um, a little over 2,000, and then the vacant 2,268. So um, actually, that's the owned number. So the vacant number is even bigger. So there's opportunities there. Um, there's issues there, but rental housing in this neighborhood um, and the existing residents, uh, we, we've really fought the, the study area allows you to identify and manage um, that process and to think about that development. And the other piece is the mixed income community. One of the things, we heard this from the mayor, uh, but we also heard this from the residents and we heard this from the stakeholders that we met with, which is that everybody's in agreement that it should be a mixed income community. And mixed income communities, what you're looking at is diversity of incomes, diversity of housing types to make that work. Um, and focusing on a continuum of, of affordability uh, in this area would be very critical because the majority of the current households are living in market rate um, unrestricted housing that is already at below 60% of AMI. So if you look at that and then you look at the current tax abatement um, policy that we do have um, here in Columbus, and that is focused uh, at 80% of AMI and above, you sort of see there's this gap. And that gap, um, addressing that gap and defining the residents and the units to protect um, and how to incentivize development around that with the opportunity of the vacant units is what we um, recommend really focusing in and honing in on. Um, housing policy recommendations, we prioritize them. So the top priority was to protect existing residents. Uh, yeah, and I'll turn it over to Elijah to talk a little bit about eviction prevention and the importance there when you're thinking of the, the levels of income of the existing residents. Um, and then we'll go on to the second priority, which would be attracting new residents, and then some overarching um, themes around the substandard housing and then the policies. So Elijah, you want to talk about that? Sure. 
Good morning. So we really felt it was important to highlight the, the progress that the community has made on homelessness. The mayor has made a commitment to end homelessness as defined by federal agencies around a series of criteria and benchmarks, beginning with veterans through his participation in the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness. And the community is experiencing something that many uh, cities are facing, which is the continual flow into the homeless system. And the, the most difficult challenge is getting exits to increase into permanent housing solutions. And so really there is a need to increase the overall supply of quality, affordable, accessible uh, rental housing. And so this study area really highlights the opportunity, particularly that this community faces in developing that type of quality, affordable and accessible rental, rental housing. In addition to trying to increase housing placements into that affordable rental housing, uh, we also recognize the unique challenges that the eviction process here in, uh, in the Columbus area uh, really feeds into that system and creates the difficulty of exiting the system because of people having evictions on their records. And so really uh, to the, the complementary uh, uh, changes that we believe the city can uh, can be making are around eviction prevention. We recognize that this is not only a priority for the mayor, uh, but also for his wife and in some of the work that she is engaged in. So we really encourage a continued focus, particularly on that issue. Uh, and that will really uh, uh, phase into some of the other recommendations that we have uh, on some other uh, uh, policy changes that the city can be making. Okay. Um, and in the protecting existing residents priority, another piece um, in terms of that is looking at ways to encourage development um, of housing at the below 60% of AMI for some of the existing residents to have opportunities to move into that. So one, we just wanted to highlight, you could encourage partnerships between the housing authority and nonprofit developers where you would be able to use the 4% low income housing tax credit um, along with the tax abatement in perpetuity um, and some other things around expanding geographically the the community for all the the rental property fund uh, to assist um, in developing stewardship and good stewardship of existing rental units uh, one of the um, pieces I did also want to touch on is just home ownership. There are homeowners in this neighborhood, and we do want to make sure that there is something there. You, you do want to make sure that as development happens and as people see opportunities in this area, you plan in advance so possibilities are having a tax freeze for low-income homeowners or senior citizens, low-income seniors in their homes so that you can avoid um, that push uh, the, for selling homes or moving out and that sort of displacement. Um, in terms of the second housing policy, the priority, that opportunity of the vacant units um, is already there. So uh, the second priority we say just attract new residents and focusing developing new housing opportunities, uh, pushing density, tying that um, to tax abatements and maybe also incorporating affordability uh, targets and requirements. Uh, we wanted to indicate there are a few programs uh, around the D.C. metro area, several of the jurisdictions there that focus on that 50 to 80 percent of AMI and sort of building in, so if you're doing market rate development, you build in small pieces of that requirement so that the ongoing development of the portfolio has new affordable units being uh, created. And then also looking for opportunities for small-scale land assembly um, in the, the different areas. And one of the pieces there is, if you look at the map, one of the things we, this is our guess based on a week of looking at this. So clearly this is something that we would just sort of suggest you, um, the staff could really take and look at and sort of hone in on what that right those right lines are or areas, but the idea is to focus on the study area in phases. So west of Lockburn, maybe you're, at this point, you really need to be focusing on promoting investment and preservation because that's already started. It's nearer to the, uh, the hospital and this piece, but then east of Lockburn where um, there's a lot more disinvestment and dilapidated housing, focusing on discouraging further dis divestment and spurring reinvestment and uh, preparing for, for the future at that side. Um, part of that is that priority three, um, addressing the quality of substandard housing. 
and this is across the study area. Um, there are programs in place now that are really working well. The Healthy Homes Repair Program, um, consider scaling that, the Home Repair Improvement Grants, and those are for homeowners. Um, and then for the landlords, uh, we wanted to uh, mention the code enforcement, but really focus on an idea around, is there a way to make that tax abatement available as an incentive to existing landlords who might then have an incentive to put money back into their properties um, and repair those um, to basically increase that, that standard of housing? And then I'm, Harriet uh, will now take over. <laughs> One of the things I would just say is that uh, you know we're really impressed by the the spirit of inquiry that the city is bringing to this project in this area, and the notion that if you think about it in advance, if you use data, if you if you know where you're going, that you're much more likely to be able to get there. And so I think we really tried to respond in that same spirit with, with numbers using the great data that the city provided us to say, look, every other place in America just throws policies at something and hope something works out. Well, you've given us the data to be able to say very specifically what the gaps are and give you very specific suggestions about how to, how to fill those gaps, how to meet those gaps, and even how to take your foot off the brake in some cases with the tax abatements to give yourself time to actually do the things that you need to do to get the outcome that you say that you want. You have a lot of policies as well in uh, in Columbus that are a little bit at odds, you know, with what you're talking about. So I'll, be, I'll use parking as the example. Some of the data you gave us show that 36% of households in this study area don't have even a single automobile. Yet the zoning requirement is for two parking spaces per dwelling unit in this area. So it's a total mismatch. It increases the cost of housing and it just sort of makes you seem kind of blind to what neighborhoods might actually need. There's a lot of on-street parking uh, available in these neighborhoods. So this is an example of where you, know, you could really fine tune in a way to better align your goals. Um, Accessory dwelling units is another is another piece of it. Layla talked about tax abatements, but another way to increase the ability to stay in place as you as your neighborhood changes around you is to give you another source of income. Accessory dwelling units would provide uh, that additional income, but also create an uh, additional housing, additional density that that does a lot to restore historic levels of density in neighborhoods like this one that have seen a lot of demographic changes and smaller households that would support the retail that we're talking about and support the transportation services. And there's a way to do that that would make it available. Um, I would also say that uh, you know one of the most important things about this that no city does very well is have those metrics, a dashboard that shows you how things are changing. So you know right away, is your policy doing what you're intended? Are you headed in the right direction? Or oh no, you're headed in the wrong direction and you need to make a policy adjustment. So we've suggested some things that you might want to track that would help you fine tune your policies on an ongoing basis, but also give you that signal that if you're being successful, hey, let's expand this maybe to other parts of the city because this seems to be working um, so that you can do the thing that this study was intended to do, which is uh, come up with a, a creative set of solutions uh, for problems that actually affect not just Columbus citywide, but frankly, every growing city in America. All right, thank you. Okay. Good morning. So, I'll make sure I've got this right. Okay, so um, as you as you can tell, we've spent a lot of time focused on affordable housing in this neighborhood, but we really realize that in order for uh, the community to be healthy, um, there's got to be levels and different types of affordability, not only for residents but also business operators, um, so that jobs and opportunities can be created, and and the residents can feel the impact, positive impact of economic change in the neighborhoods. So. <clears throat> 
When we met um, over this week, um, Mayor Ginther uh, said Columbus is an opportunity city where residents are most likely to go from poverty to middle class. And we felt like that was sort of a call to action. Uh, we took that to heart and we, we believe that this neighborhood is ripe um, for exactly that kind of result. And so we want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the economic mobility opportunities that exist in this neighborhood as we're looking at housing because in an urban environment, housing and uh, commercial oftentimes coexist and is very comp can be very complementary uh, to one another. Um, <clears throat> Oops. So we heard from um, many of the stakeholders that we met with and from Mayor Ginther that metrics, uh, establishing metrics for measurement, how do you measure success, how do you know when you're moving the needle, is very important. And the residents want that as well. Um, we, we know that the Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Families program is great and it's tracking health outcomes in the neighborhood. That's really important and that's really good data. You cannot have an economically healthy community if you don't have a physically healthy uh, community, but the neighborhood would also like to have other metrics. You know, they want to know how many jobs are being, being created, how many residents are being employed um, by these local businesses and, and these partners. They want to know how the, uh, the needle is moving as well. So we felt like it was important to establish um, uh, uh, metrics that are aligned and aligned between the city, the hospital, area businesses, and do it now. Now is absolutely uh, the right time to establish your baseline. So year over year, you can see, you know, what um, what results are you getting? Where are you making impact? Where can you make corrections along the way uh, to make further? Um, impact in the neighborhood and um, and also it becomes a great vehicle for getting back to the community keeping that ongoing line of communication open uh, between the residents the business owner and the community so the other thing that that really struck us is just within a couple of miles there's some major employment centers uh, from this neighborhood but the unemployment is really high why is that the case you've got the downtown area you've got the hospital um, and you've got uh, rickenbacker where you've got tons of logistic jobs we heard 13,900 logistic jobs um, these jobs need to be translated to opportunities for the residents of this neighborhood so how do we better connect um, the, the neighborhood to, to these opportunities? Um, well, first of all, you've got some really good, strong commercial corridors. Uh, Livingston and Parsons in particular uh, represent great opportunities for commercial development. Um, the developers told us, you know, we, we, we would like to develop in, in this neighborhood, but we need um, uh, projects of scale projects with, you know, with um, some critical mass to them, and also projects that are mix, uh, a mix of uses, that bring in some uh, retail supporting retail, um, uh, services um, and other businesses that might employ uh, the uh, residents of the neighborhood. You know, we, we find that many of the local businesses that will locate in neighbors, uh, neighborhoods like this, not only do the customers live in the neighborhood, but the business owners live in the neighborhood. So really capitalize on this opportunity to add some density uh, to these commercial corridors and leverage them to create better outcomes for job creation um, and opportunity for the residents and, and help the developers make their numbers work. It's okay to make a profit. Uh, the developers have got to see, you know, more density on the commercial corridors. What does that mean? It might be big, um, taller buildings. It might be more units, and and there's some trade-offs. You know, the city wants some things, the residents want some things back. Developers, you know, they they want affordable units built into your uh, projects. They want neighborhood-serving retail built into these projects. So in exchange for that, you know, <clears throat> maybe you get some density credits. Maybe you get some relief on uh, parking requirements. We we know you have a tax abatement program. So it's really a give and take uh, where it can become a win-win situation. So again, the idea here is that we want the folks who live in this area and do business in this area to be able to enjoy 
the benefits of a growing economy. And that hasn't always happened to date. So there's some things we wanted to talk about in terms of both attracting investment in the corridors and connecting it to the folks who live there. And there's some key things here, especially with some of the assets you have. Whoops. Am I going the wrong way? Yeah, no, no, this is good. So, <laughs> so the idea here is that um, the existing incentives that we have uh, are good, um, but they may need some refreshing. And I think the Neighborhood Commercial Revitalization Investment Fund is a good example. If we can target this to help grow locally owned businesses in the study area, that would be a great benefit, not just to the businesses in this area, but the people who live in this area. Because one of the strengths of this area is the fact that these corridors can be assets and they can be better connected to the folks who live there. Right now, that isn't always the case. So this is a tool that we think will help grow businesses in the neighborhood and provide them benefits at the same time. One of the other things we learned is that there's a merchants association along Parsons and they haven't really been engaged with by anybody. They're just trying to get through each week. They're just trying to make payroll every week. One of the ideas here is they can help facilitate the formation of other similar organizations, maybe along the other corridors like Maine or Livingston. And the idea here is that as businesses relate to each other and feel like they can be successful, they form a connection to the place. And that connection to the place then makes them part of the neighborhood. And as they share in that, we can um, create an atmosphere that's attractive for more entrepreneurs. In fact, we think this area can really be an incubator for entrepreneurship in general. Lots of opportunity there. And again, um, this is something that hasn't been fully leveraged. Obviously, the Nationwide Children's Hospital is a huge asset for this area. And to their credit, they have stepped up and they've expanded, uh, they've expanded in size and they've made a huge commitment financially in this area. But we, we really think that the hospital is a key collaborator both for the neighborhood but also for uh, the future. So think about this. If the hospital could better utilize local businesses for contracts they have, if they can procure goods from local businesses, that allows everybody to win. They have a connection locally and they spur the local economy and the money gets recycled in our community instead of going somewhere else. The other idea is that the, they could help establish more neighborhood focused uh, business strategies so that they are looking more carefully around the businesses in the, in the area that they live in. Not only can they connect with the businesses, but this is a great place for employees of the hospital to live. Right now, people travel farther. If we could reduce the amount of travel between the folks who work for the hospital and the neighborhood, that would be great. The hospital currently provides housing assistance benefits to their employees. But if we thought they targeted that for those who live in the neighborhood, that would be another way for them to further support the neighborhood that they exist in. Workforce development and giving people the tools they need to be successful in a job is critical. And we know that uh, having a workforce that is uh, able to meet the needs of employers is a key to success in the economy. And it's really a key as individual people. You feel like um, much more resilient and much more able to deal with adversity in life if you've got the skills to be successful in the workplace. So one of the ideas is that we focus a little more on workforce development programs that really engage um, the folks who live in this area. And by that I mean both the businesses as well as the residents. One of the ideas is that having them um, be trained to meet the job opportunities that are in the general vicinity. So that includes not only the hospital, but the local businesses along the corridor, as well as um, the, the emerging employment center in Rickenbacker. So the idea here is that um, 
these job training and internship opportunities give people uh, a new path to different kinds of employment that they may not have fully considered before. And there's a range of opportunities, not only at the hospital, but elsewhere in this area. And those, those diverse training opportunities or those diverse job opportunities just need to be backed up with the right kind of training. There we go. So I wanted to show you this graphic because this illustrates one of the huge assets that this community brings. This concept that you can walk within 10 minutes from the place that you live to the place that you work is powerful. Not only do you have an opportunity to uh, be close to services, but it gives you a connection to the place that you live, where you care about it, where it, it feels like it's yours. And we believe that the study area has that potential. This is illustrated here with the Livingston Commercial Corridor, but really the same thing applies to Maine and the same thing applies to Parsons. And it's this idea that if you can walk to a place, it's positive for you. It's good for you physically, but it's also good for you emotionally and socially. You meet friends, you interact with your neighbors, and you have an opportunity to live, work, and play in proximity to where you are. Um, this idea of connections and mobility is really important. So I want to talk about a couple of the strategies here. One, of course, that we've touched on already is the parking issues. You know, this kind of cuts both ways. Businesses need to have the parking. They need to be successful. But neighbors don't want to have business parking spilling over into their areas. So we need to create some strategies that work for businesses and work for neighborhoods. We also know that if we can connect residents of this area to where they work, that's going to be a huge advantage for us. The bus routes that exist currently along these corridors are a key way for people to connect. And in, I know in my community and many major cities, this issue of paying for transit and ridership is, is in play. And people are going to be making decisions about cutting service or enhancing service. So I want you to think about the value that public transit provides to this area. The other comment I wanted to make is about the walk score. This is just a way to measure how friendly an area is for walking. And this area, I think, would benefit from having some strategies related to bicycle mobility and pedestrian mobility and accessibility that can make it even more attractive. So I want, want you to think about that. And then the last comment here is that um, some kind of a shuttle service to employment centers will again help make this area attractive. And remember here, the big idea is that we need to hang on to the wealth that is generated in this community for the people who live in this area. That's the big concept here. And to the extent that people feel like that can be achieved at this location, they will want to be here. Businesses will want to be here, and we'll have those connections that allow everybody to thrive. And, and that's really important, because in the past, that has not always been the case. People feel like everybody else is doing better, but I'm not. I'm being left behind. So I want you to think about that uh, in terms of economic development strategies, that it's really important that wealth go to and be shared at the people level. Think about the people. They're the ones who are going to be able to uh, ensure that this area will thrive in the future. I'll turn it over at this point to Boak. So, so far you've heard about community planning and also a pretty good deep dive on housing and the opportunities for economic mobility. Our section is a slightly different. Ours is to look at the toolkit of tools that are available to the city and how those can be perhaps enhanced or filled out. We're we doing this wrong way. There we go. Um, this quote, failure is an important ingredient to success, is a concept that I think the city needs to embrace. This didn't get 
to this situation overnight and it's not going to get solved overnight. It's going to get solved with a lot of trial and error. And the more you have a chance to learn from the mistakes you make, the better results you're going to have in the long run. I do this. So am I in the right slide here? These are your slides. <laughs> We're rolling with it. I know. <laughs> We're so well prepared that he's going to take over. Here. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> in that order. Um, well, I think just echoing my colleague, um, one of the things we did notice in a lot of the conversations was that both the mayor, this team, the business community, as well as the local residents really wanted to achieve an equitable future for this particular neighborhood, but also the city. But one of the things we've noticed from across the country, a lot of communities create tools and incentives to do that, but oftentimes they're what we call one-on-one tools and incentives. And oftentimes the tools itself are reactionary. And so this is a slide, just kind of give you an example of one of the major tools in the neighborhood that's also used across the city that really is a major tax abatement. And we heard throughout the community that while this is a good tool, it actually doesn't answer the ultimate question that the mayor set out before. Does this tool achieve the equitable development in terms of the building itself, but also the equitable outcomes? Now with that, we also had a conversation with a lot of the neighborhood groups and the business community, and we said, what are some of the great tools that you think work? And you heard it from some of our other colleagues that co talked about the neighborhood uh, commercial revitalization grants. We talked about the homeowner repair. Um, there's a lot of active NGOs. But even despite these tools, despite their well intentions, and I want to add, ditto to all my colleagues' uh, recommendations on these improvements, but despite that, there's still barriers to achieving the equitable development and equitable outcomes in your community. And here is just a list of those items that we heard from not just the development community who are trying to make a buck, but also from the city leadership and residents. The fact that it's very difficult to go to scale in this neighborhood. It's very difficult to understand what the heck is happening in the neighborhood. All of these create a level of uncertainty, distrust, and lack of confidence that the city would still be the op America's opportunity uh, city for the future. Now with that, we recognize that our call of action was to look at those existing tools and incentives and ask ourselves what could we suggest to the city, to the local business community, and to local residents that would actually take that idea of, you know, Miss Fizzle from Magic School Bus, take chances, make mistakes, get miss messy, because in one of the things you recognize from equitable development, you actually have to take a risk. You actually have to get your hands dirty because the only failure to achieving equitable outcomes is not trying. And the way we've done that is basically created a framework for how you take your current incentives and gaps and how to fill them. The three frameworks we would like to introduce is that there's a citywide framework, there's a place space framework and a people-focused framework. And my colleagues both will talk about the citywide framework. There we go. <laughs> Thanks for getting me on track. I think uh, there's sort of two priorities here. The first is there's got to be a commitment to inclusive housing. Uh, inclusionary mixed income housing policy that's applied citywide. It should be linked to density bonuses and tax abatements that are within the context of the city and of those specific areas as well. Um, a citywide mixed income financing program is important as well. I mean, other cities have used GO bonds to actually leverage capital to induce and put into investment in um, affordable housing. We also think that there's a need for a resource connector. Um, is there a way to match up resources from developers or homeowners or investors with the opportunities and the programs that are out there. The second priority is to really accelerate the economic development investments. We think that there's a potential here with uh, investment tax credits. You have an income tax in the city. Um, is it possible to uh, copy some other areas? Uh, many of you are familiar with the historic pres National Historic Preservation Tax Credit where 10% of the income tax, you know, 10% of your um, costs on a project are an income tax credit. Uh, in South Carolina, we have the abandoned building tax credit. 
uh, where an investor or a group uh, agrees to renovate an abandoned building, 25% of those costs are a tax credit. Now the way that works is that you can then take that 25% of that cost and you can have that tax credit and you invite investors into your project and those investors are buying those credits from you. They may not buy them at par, they might buy them at 75 cents on the, value, on, on the dollar. So we saw a project on Parsons Avenue and there was approximately $2 million worth of investment. 25% of that is a half million dollars worth of tax credits. At 75%, that's you know, somewhere 350 to $400,000 of free equity that can go into a project. Um, I think also there are enhancing and improving uh, the revitalization grants that you have and funding those, fully funding those and making them available, that's a, a pretty important tool that you can enhance. So with that, let me turn it over to Marty. Thank you. Um, I'm sure all of you, I hope, have noticed a theme to our presentation today. And this slide is really just a reminder that tools are not just about deals and about buildings. Tools also, to be successful in this kind of neighborhood effort, need to be focused on strategies for the people that live there and hopefully will continue to live there and participate in the new things and great things happening in the neighborhood. So this is just a reminder. I'm not gonna go through the list of ideas. It's important to create strategies for renters um, and there are lots of creative things that can happen, especially thinking about how to help people stay in the neighborhood. Uh, we called it bad house to good home, but to really think about there may be people living in substandard housing that for the health of themselves and their family need to have a new place and finding ways to help them move to good homes is really important. Um, existing homeowners, people have been a part of this neighborhood for a long time, think about lots of strategies to help them stay in their homes, especially as they age and may want to continue to participate in the neighborhood. Um, property tax strategies to freeze or abate property taxes can be a great way to help make that happen. There are a lot of community-focused and service-focused agencies operating in this neighborhood. A city should really think about working with them, people who have worked with residents, to think about new ways to really create some place ba people based tools to help make this neighborhood successful for everyone. <coughs> And finally, we recognize that place matters. The zip code determines outcome, whether it's health, education, social mobility. And one of the things that we recognize is that uh, the city did not have many place-based uh, incentives. However, most recently, uh, the city, working in conjunction with the governor, identified key parcels, key census tracts for the, the national community to bring new investment through the opportunity zones. How many of you, by a show of hand, know about opportunity zones? Okay, good. Well, as you know, this is a major investment vehicle for the private sector to come and invest in low-income census tracts. But one of the key elements about this particular program on the federal level, there is no requirement for those investment funds on what type of projects they would invest in. And we see this as a unique opportunity for the city. Specifically, the fact of the matter is that you have a vibrant local investment community. You have very uh, 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 forward-thinking development group, investor group. You have the hospital. You also have a number of NGOs on the ground. One of the things we found and heard throughout our stakeholder conversations is that no one has brought these groups together and discuss what should be the investment strategy in these opportunity zone nodes. We've heard specifically from uh, some of the real estate development community that said, if you brought us a plan that's approved by the city, that is endorsed by the neighborhood, we will figure out a way to fund it regardless of there's a gap. And I think that is the opportunity that we have here. And so one of the main recommendations we believe that you should apply not only to the study area, but throughout the city where you do have opportunity zones, that you should have an inclusive uh, investment strategy that brings the residents, the local real estate community, as well as business partners in the city to actually endorse that and move that forward. Also, there's some low-hanging fruits. One of the things we uh, learned very quickly is that there's no CDE, uh, Community Development Enterprise, uh, here in this, not only in uh, the study area, but in the city, which means you can't really tap into the new markets tax credit pro pro program. So for all of those corridor studies you're doing, this is a valuable program to accelerate job creation. 
Uh, the next strategic priority, we believe, that has to go beyond your traditional economic development. Oftentimes, we hear if a local low-income uh, resident gets a job at, at, for contracting or is able to work at a new restaurant, we've achieved success. But one of the things we heard uh, amongst the residents and even amongst uh, other stakeholders is that that is not enough for this city uh, to be perceived as America's opportunity city. So one of the things we recommend is that in addition to those job opportunities, you should be thinking about how to give the existing residents, and a key word here, existing residents, opportunities to share in the wealth that will be created in this neighborhood. And one of the suggestions we heard is that using the opportunity zones, you may bring foundations who will buy shares on behalf of those residents and maybe create a financial program where they learn how to save, do investments, and at a certain period of time, they will acquire those shares and basically through the life of the fund, will be generating wealth in the local neighborhood. The idea here is we should go beyond just being the typical city. We're trying to be the, the America's most opportunity city in the country. And last but not least, uh, one of the, probably one of the simple hanging fruits we have, we saw that you have a land bank. And there are a lot of conversations here in terms of how to do that well. However, we had a number of other groups who are doing similar activities, like the Next Gen group and, uh, and the hospital. The question is, how can we centralize those operations around an investment strategy in these neighborhoods to really take advantage of the window that you have in terms of buying the, the land cheap to, prevent, to, to protect the affordability, but also to create these wealth opportunities. And sorry, last but not least, I think it's actually more important, if anything, uh, for us to communicate to you, and this is something we heard from the residents, is that while we're having all these activity from the city, from the hospital, from the business community, it is important to create transparency. And one of the ways a lot of communities are doing this in terms of their tools is creating an equitable development scorecard where the city or the variety of actors who are doing investments will actually score their investment based on community engagement, the land use, the economic development and wealth creation, transportation, attainable housing, and projects that meet high scores on the equitable development should receive or should be prioritized in getting those tools and those incentives. And in that way, you create a, a transparent uh, 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 apparatus that allows not the residents, but also the business community to know what direction the city and this community wants to go. So with that, we'll turn it back over to our co-chairs to round us out. My legs asleep. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for being so patient as we tell you about your city. Um, it's, it's certainly easy to give advice, and it's a lot harder to implement it, and we recognize that. Um, it's also very clear to us after spending time here that you really have a tremendous group of participants that are well intended uh, and really committed to the future of this city. Your mayor is thinking ahead. Um, there is an opportunity to secure an equitable um, future in this neighborhood and it's um, a, a, an opportunity not to be missed. Um, you are collaborating a lot, and we encourage you to continue collaborating and growing together with um, the understanding of the shared challenges and to continue to build trust. Trust is very important. Reduce costs. Truly align your zoning with your goals. The variance process is not a sustainable process. It costs the staff, it costs the community, and those costs are ultimately passed down to the end user, the renter or the buyer of the home. The variance process should really be used sparingly, not broadly. There's an economic gap, and this is not unusual, there's an economic gap between subsidized rents in the new developments and existing rents in that study area. You really have to work together to figure that out. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, Economic development, and this has been hammered home, is, is absolutely key to, to advance wealth creation um, and skills growth. It's not just about protecting uh, the low uh, 
uh, cost of housing. It's allowing people to advance through the spectrum of housing and grow their skill set. Um, you do have a narrow window. Now's the time to act. You have great people. You have a tremendous development community that is local and it truly cares about the future of the city. That is unique. It's not always the case. A lot of times you have national developers that are really there for the economic profit. You truly have developers here solving for the triple bottom line. That's unique. Leverage that. Um, make sure you provide mixed income tools. Allow your developers, incentivize them, work with them, and, and, and push them, challenge them to deliver mixed income projects. Don't segregate by this is the affordable, this is the market rate. Bring it together. Work together. Thank you. Uh, one of the things we definitely want to highlight, I want to uh, echo the points of my partner. We've, many of us have done this a number of times, and you guys really have an active and engaged mayor. Uh, in addition to being here and welcoming us on Tuesday, he came yesterday and answered some hard questions. Uh, we kind of peppered him hard, and he was there and didn't shy away from him and did not deflect. And so for that, we want to acknowledge uh, your participation, uh, Mayor Kinther. Additionally, for all of the residents here and for the mayor, you got a phenomenal staff. Uh, we've seen some less than phenomenal staffs. And you, you definitely have one that was responsive, that uh, was available, that provided us every piece of information that we needed. If Mark gives us one more email, we will be <laughs> staff, I think. But uh, no, and, and they were Mark, Mark, Steve, uh, Hannah. I mean, they were tremendous in this effort. And so definitely kudos to the staff as well. They were outstanding. But enough with the kudos. The staff has homework. Well done. All right. Uh, we want them to know as part of this process, there is uh, a homework that they have to do to be a part of this effort, but also to be responsive uh, to the community to be able to get these recommendations going. As we noted earlier, not only will this study be available online to all of you, but also we wanted to ensure that there are measurements that they can put in place, not only in the short term, but in the long term, to be able to get some of our recommendations up and running. The very first one, as you may have heard throughout our process, was the uh, uh, highlight of engagement, right? We think it's important that they assign a staff person to identify best practices and initial partners to begin to really uh, cultivate and uh, community partnerships actively and actively engage our community. Uh, you don't have to pick that person right now, but uh, we are uh, asking that you begin to assign somebody to really uh, begin to establish uh, those best practices and identify them. Additionally, we want uh, the team to identify low and very low income unrestricted units in the study area and how many of those will be needed over the long term. Uh, the study area was defined for a number of reasons, but we want all of these measurements to be replicable throughout the city. So we want to be able to begin to address what that number of low income and very low income units are in this area and then begin to see how we can address that throughout the city. Uh, the target number here is small enough to be a household specific strategy that we can then grow uh, throughout the city, throughout this opportunity city. Uh, number three, assign staff to conduct outreach to our existing business and draft new goals for the Neighborhood Commercial Revitalization Investment Fund based on the feedback. Uh, again, we believe that if we want our commercial corridors to continue to grow, including uh, a lot of small base and entrepreneurial uh, efforts from the city, uh, within the city, we want to ensure that that NCR is operating in the very best fashion it can be. And then number four, create an inclusive, equitable development project scorecard to inform the investment priorities and decision making. Just a scorecard to be able to know if you're going the right direction, right? We want to make sure that, okay, we're checking the boxes here, we need to strengthen this part, and we want to be able to ensure that we're going in uh, the right direction together. Uh, there will be a test on May 1st in Detroit, <laughs> so you guys will have a couple of weeks to work on this. You can sleep this weekend and get to it on Monday. But with that, uh, we also want to ensure and want to thank the team for a number of participants that we met with. This is a list of residents, of business owners, of partners that the staff helped put together. Uh, we applaud them for choosing people that did not always agree with everything the mayor is doing. They did not always agree with everything the staff is doing. Uh, but they came, and I applaud the staff for picking people that were not yes men and yes women. And we were able to really hear um, everything that the city is going 
the city, where the city is going, what the city is doing, right and wrong. Uh, we had a phenomenal time on Wednesday meeting with them. Uh, you know, it was snowing, so I didn't mind being inside. <laughs> but uh, we definitely were able to learn quite a bit from many of you here, as well as throughout the city. With that, we want to transition to our organization team, and I think we want to, oh, it's us. Oh, it's the mayor. Well, uh, the mayor, you're coming up next, just so you know. So we want to transition over to you, and we're going to be available for uh, questions as well. Thank you. Well, just very briefly, uh, uh, please join me, all of uh, those that have participated this week, if you would just give our our co-chairs and this amazing team of fellows a round of applause and appreciation for all their work this week. It's not every day that you are able to draw upon uh, the best of your local community and match them up with some of the most experienced and skilled uh, greatest advocates for a shared prosperity in your community from folks from around the country. And so this has been a great opportunity this week for me to spend time uh, with these great leaders, uh, but also to hear directly from folks in our community that are working with us uh, to make sure that we are building a future uh, where everyone can share in the success story that is Columbus. Uh, this area, uh, Director Shoney and his team uh, identified uh, early on, and we thought there was a, a great chance uh, for us to draw upon this incredible experience and perspective from around the country uh, and match it up with the great neighborhood and community leadership here in Columbus. And so uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the director and his team uh, for making this week so successful. Uh, and all the community and neighborhood leaders. I mean, you see them listed here uh, from across the board, our private sector. I think we're blessed with one of the strongest uh, private sector uh, development communities in all of America. I'd put our development community up against anybody else uh, in this country. Uh, one of the reasons is they're really good. Uh, and uh, what makes them so good is that they're committed to uh, the overall community benefit? What's collectively uh, in our best interest? How do we make sure that uh, the community we're building today is one that includes everyone tomorrow? And so uh, I'm excited about their engagement uh, and their leadership in this. But our neighborhood and community leaders, you know, this is a thriving, diverse, dynamic community. But we are that because of the amazing and distinctive great neighborhoods that we have. And we, collectively of the city, uh, you can't have a great city unless you have amazing neighborhoods. Uh, and I appreciate some of the, the very specific recommendations because we know the, the heart, the foundation of great neighborhoods is stable and strong families. And so uh, really understanding how housing can be that great vaccine to help us deal with stabilizing families and challenges around infant mortality, shared prosperity, uh, upward mobility, uh, and making sure that we remain focused on that uh, as we move forward. Uh, we do have homework. Uh, and uh, I haven't been more excited about homework <laughs> in such a long period of time uh, because uh, we have an incredible opportunity. Uh, as was mentioned here. We're going to see dramatic and dynamic growth in this community in the next 20 years uh, that we may have seen over the last 75 or 90 years. But we don't have much time. There is a sense of urgency to this work. Uh, we have to be purposeful, people-focused, and make sure that every family in every neighborhood is sharing in our success. As I asked and, 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 and begged their indulgence yesterday at lunch, um, for us to really embrace and realize the vision of becoming America's Opportunity City, 
where we have the largest middle class of any city our size in the country and a place you're more likely to go from poverty to the middle class and beyond than anywhere else. This work, this common purpose and vision has to remain our top priority. It will require difficult decisions. It will not happen without controversy, questions. There will be resistance. Change is hard. But I think shared prosperity and success for folks, regardless of where they live in this community, is worth that hard work. And I look forward to doing that with you uh, together and appreciate so much uh, the incredible team at Rose, all these amazing fellows from around the country. Uh, and I look forward to reporting out to you uh, in Detroit when we get together here very soon. Thank you. So we're available for questions. Uh, we do have uh, mics throughout the room. We can turn the chairs around, all the team. So it's not just, it ain't just me and Lev. Y'all gonna do us like that. Uh, I do wanna acknowledge the fact that um, this is one of the largest teams that Rose Fellowship has ever done. Uh, and it was really to address uh, the myriad of opportunities that we've seen from a phenomenal city here. How did I get by, how by, why am I by myself back here? Uh, the, the, I sit in the front, you know. Uh, so, so we definitely want to acknowledge that. But we do have um, design and economic development professionals from all over the country, uh, as well as three people that'll be doing homework just like you guys. So uh, it'll be an um, uh, equitable uh, effort throughout all. Do we do have some mics, so if you have a question, I guess you just raise your hand, and they will get a mic to you very quickly. Uh, all of you will become media stars. I think this is being filmed at 3 a.m. Uh, local Columbus time, so, you know, keep yourselves up. I was about to say, we're that good, outstanding. There we go. So, I may not be aware, but, you know, the what are the major incentives for affordable housing? for? that are in place for investors to encourage investors to offer affordable housing. Because I know there's tax incentives in place for vacant properties to remodel them, um, tax incentives for that. But then as an investor, it would make sense to do market rents, um, takes the tax advantages and then do market rents. So what is the incentive to do affordable housing? Are there tax credits? Is it subsidized by the city? I'm sure they don't want to do that. But um, what, what are those incentives? That's my question. speak to the locals and local Yeah, um, what we have on the table right now, uh, we use a variety of federal programs. The federal low-income housing tax credits, typically we use what's called a 9% credit. As I think the group rightly pointed up, we have um, some additional capacity. There's another kind of credit called a 4% credit. I've just about exhausted my full knowledge on the specifics and details of those because they are really complex programs. Um, we have some city home funds, some city capital funds that we'll use to offset some of those costs. I think one of the things we've recognized and one of the reasons we called the group in is we know that while we're getting some projects done, we're not getting enough done. The mayor in his capital budget announcement earlier this week uh, committed to working with our low-income housing providers, um, committed $5 million. Um, in cooperation with our low-income housing providers. We're hoping to leverage that much, much more um, with the private sector and with other um, governments, hopefully, to really put more city money and more community money into housing. I would encourage you on the specifics to either talk to Hannah, who's sitting right next to you, or Rita Priest, who's um, back over there. But uh, that's kind of the, the current status answer. I think one of the things uh, that was clear in this presentation is there, is there some models from around the country that I think we can look at and rely on. I thought the sort of modeling a city level um, uh, tax credit program modeled on kind of the new markets or um, historic preservation tax credits I thought was a really creative idea. You know, another strategy that other developers around the country have uh, sort of used when they're not familiar or really interested in creating a whole new part of their company to do affordable housing 
there are a lot of nonprofits, both community-based, citywide, and uh, around this area that have deep expertise in affordable housing, and there have often been some creative partnerships um, where you, as a developer, would be able to draw on some of the knowledge and skills and expertise of those organizations to bring that to a uh, cooperative partnership. So uh, that's worth another strategy to consider. And I would just say zoning tools, um, things like density bonuses in exchange for some level of affordability, uh, one of the things that high cost cities uh, have more routinely done is use every bit of public facility land uh, to co-develop housing mm -hmm. along with things like libraries, fire stations, uh, you know, DMV facilities, whatever it might be. If you can front on different streets and have different entrances, they can often uh, operate very, very compatibly. But those are the kinds of things that make it possible then for a developer who now has no land acquisition cost, no holding costs for the land to be able to provide some affordability with some needed housing. Hey guys, uh, thank you for all your work uh, this week. It, it was really impressive. Um, we've had a lot of discussion in the community recently about the 54,000 households that we have living that are paying more than 50% of their income to rent. And uh, I heard some of your presentation talking about evictions and how we prevent that. We've talked a little bit about landlords and, and the fact that um, uh, they maintain probably less desirable housing. Um, what are some of the strategies that you might suggest to us to deal with this issue where we've got apparently 54,000 landlords who are allowing renters to pay more than 50% of their income to rent? What are we gonna do about these landlords and, and should we do something about this? And how do we tie this into the eviction process? Because it appears that a lot of these folks who are being evicted are now going back into the same kind of housing unit that they lived previously where they're paying more than 50% of their income to rent. So I know that's a complicated question and, and it's probably much broader than our study area, but I thought I would bring that up as an issue as you've brought up the issue of evictions. Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, I'll try and take a first uh, crack at it. I think it's, uh, we've recognized that uh, it's a dual track kind of, of, of an issue. It's, it's not only an issue of housing, it's also an issue of incomes. So there's a lot of work that needs to be focused in, uh, on, on both sides of that equation. On the housing side, you know, we, you heard at multiple points within the presentation that we wanted to uh, really encourage a, a scaling of the Healthy Homes uh, program that's out there. Um, that um, I think in terms of, of encouraging landlords to, to do those improvements, you have to not only provide them with uh, the access to the funds, but I think one of the concerns that we heard was that there was also some concerns about inviting the city out to, to, to uh, look at making those types of repairs and then being found liable for other uh, code violations. And so that's something that we, we think the city really needs to, to think, think more deeply on. Um, I just want to add on the eviction prevention just in looking at that that can oftentimes be um, it's a crisis moment but it's a moment where you can actually meet the person who's in crisis so emergency rental assistance programs um, or legal services uh, setting up systems where people can get free legal services pro bono um, in order to work through that and then also I, understanding I think the eviction um, process here is is very quick <laughs> so I think there's some definite policy adjustments that could be done to that to have so that uh, it's not um, a sort of uh, just quick like the landlord doesn't have to show up or things like that there's a lot of pieces there that can be done and then once you've actually made contact with those people that's when you can actually see what their actual situation is so um, that's just one piece on eviction prevention this study area is actually small enough where you can do this on a instead of th scaling it immediately you can actually do it on a almost pilot basis and really understand what the, the households are facing and what they're addressing. The slumlords issue, we, we heard that is an issue. Um, we also heard that some maybe people don't have incentives for uh, repairing landlords. Maybe they need more incentives to put money into the properties. Um, that is something that people will understand much better on a granular level, but code enforcement is very important. As much as you don't want to 
um, for homeowners, you, you don't want to displace people by code enforcement, but at the same time, you have to, it, it is important to know the issues and to be aggressive so that uh, you can understand where substandard housing needs to be improved. And then um, that, just one last thing, that, that good home, bad homes, bad house, Bad house to good home. That whole just that concept is just sort of this is a small enough area on a pilot basis. You could probably look at strategically moving people into better quality housing um, if you build it. Yeah. Okay. This will be quick. Um, I echo everything my teammates made, but quite frankly, uh, I, I, you know, Layla's very polite. The eviction process is garbage. You need to get that changed immediately. This whole, you can file on somebody and not go to court, uh, you need to throw it out the window. No one does that. That's not good for people. Uh, I don't have a flight till 425. If I need to go see somebody to tell them that, I can. But uh, that, that is a process that is absolutely ridiculous. And for this city to move forward and be an opportunity city, you have to get that off the books immediately. Next question. Not nearly inspiring, but doing it, doing it, looking at the uh, at a at a narrower study area, and then a uh, and then zooming back, really highlighted one thing that's unusual about Columbus uh, that isn't necessarily good, like the eviction policy. Uh, and that, that you're pretty transportation cost burdened here. The two highest household costs are housing and transportation. And a lot of cities, and when I was at HUD, we created an index to put those numbers together because they, they absolutely trade off. In this neighborhood, 36% of people don't own cars. Why? Not because they hate cars, because they can't afford cars and housing, right? So if, if you in, did more to invest in transportation, that would actually lower some of the pressure that people feel uh, on their on their budgets and, and figuring out how to do this. Because you are also an outlier within the state of Ohio. You are much more car dependent here in Columbus than any other city uh, in Ohio of any kind of size. And that also means when you transition you know, toward more ride sharing or toward more shared mobility, the shock of it is going to be felt very strongly here, especially as you're doubling down on parking requirements everywhere. So I think those policies really need to be looked at and aligned. And thinking about it in the context of affordability, inexpensive mobility is a huge boost to shared prosperity and being able to, to, uh, to advance economically. Hi. <clears throat> Hello, thanks. Um, somebody, one of you mentioned the model of buying shares. Um, I don't know your name, but uh, maybe a, a foundation would buy shares and then give it to people. I think that's kind of in line with like a shared equity model. Um, so I'm wondering if you can sit, if anybody here wants to maybe briefly discuss community land trusts and how that shared equity model could be a way for permanent affordability and home ownership for people. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We talked a lot about that. Yeah. So um, we talked a lot about the land trust mo model, but in looking at it, it's a complicated thing to set up, and oftentimes with scattered site um, property management, it can it can be very complex. Um, and there's already in place here um, a, a strategic fund to work on. Uh, stewardship with the rental housing and the 15% the goal that um, community um, for all people has. Um, so in looking at it from just a practical standpoint, it seemed like the land bank is already here. You have the county land bank, the city land bank. There's ways to achieve on the housing side the same sort of um, t goals that a land trust looks for, which is protecting existing residents, giving them a stake in the future, and providing like home ownership or good rental opportunity opportunities. Uh, the, I think the, it was m mentioned more on the economic development side where we did think that there was a big opportunity. So, so in my community, we have a community land trust and it took us years to set it up. And while it's working pretty effectively, I think Layla's making a really good point. You have land that the land bank owns and you just need to be able to have a clear strategy what you want to do with that land. And it's one thing to be able to say, well, we want to, we're, we're acquiring these properties because they're blighted and we want to protect the community from that blight. 
that's a good goal. But you can do a heck of a lot more with that. If you assemble two or three of these lots together, there's a development opportunity that doesn't currently exist. The other thing that uh, can be done is you can use various funding sources to uh, help um, buy down the cost of that land for developers and offer it for development for proposals and all you need to do is establish what's your goal, what are you trying to accomplish here, whether you're having a goal that has to do with density or has to do with a mix of land uses, those are all within your control. So to the community a land trust question, Yes, you should definitely look at that model, but you do have some systems in place that allow you to have the opportunity to do the exact same thing without going through the time and energy to establish your own community land trust. Not trying to discourage you, I'm just saying you have some systems in place that will get you to some results, maybe even quicker than establishing a community land trust. I want to highlight everything they just said, but with a caveat, that's building specific. And one of the things we want you to be aware of is that that is an essential tool to make sure you create the framework, but then the next layer is how do you ensure that the people in the community not only can take advantage of the affordable housing, housing stock that's being created through the land trust, can actually participate in the appreciation of value creation in that neighborhood. And one of the things we've been seeing is that there is this technology has allowed and has basically reduced the barrier for innovation individuals to share in prosperity. Uh, for example, there's a tool called Fundrise as a very pr popular crowdsource financing platform. There are other tools as well. What we see here as an opportunity is that since you're so early in the process and you have great business community, you have a great foundation ecosystem and active residents who could come together and say, you know what? We can actually, because the study area is so small, you have the ability to perhaps develop an invest, investment vehicle that can be shared jointly amongst the city, amongst the foundation, as well as the local residents. And I think that is the opportunity that you have. And I think one of the challenges we always have when we have these conversations about achieving equitable development, we often stop at the type of housing stock or a type of building that we're creating. And the people who are going into those buildings, but the question is, how do we ensure that they themselves are also moving up on the scale as well? So I think that's the thing that you want to think about. You have to be two to three dimensional when we have these conversations. Uh, good. good morning. Uh, you can probably hear me without this. Uh, Hello? All right. Uh, can you tell me a little more in detail what your project timeline looks like moving forward, um, and in particular with regard to any comprehensive rezoning reform? <laughs> so uh, you you guys may not believe this but literally we heard these recommendations when you all heard them um, ta -da. Uh, ta -da. so um, we don't know uh, <laughs> um, uh, my office is moving today I don't even have a desk today so um, uh, we'll fit it's not today um, uh, yeah, you guys have gotten to know the merits, but the, his deadline is Monday. Um, so, no, I mean, we're going to figure it out. There's a lot of things to go through in this. I think one of the homework assignments I gave myself um, as we were sitting here uh, was to kind of go through and, you know, red, yellow, green, uh, the recommendations in terms of things. Uh, and, and actually another category, there are some things that I think the group got that are, you know, very doable. Um, and very impactful that we'll want to move on early. Um, there are some things that I think are going to require some more uh, investigation. There are some things that actually there's stuff going on here that I think they kind of missed. They had three days and they got a lot of stuff right, but I think there were some things going on under the surface that they, we didn't have a chance to raise up to them. Um, and you know, going through that process and figuring that out, I think there's a lot of prioritization in this. Um, the one thing that I heard loud and clear um, is that we need to provide more certainty in the process. 
I think the zoning reform is a piece of that. And I think one of the buckets we're going to look at is, okay, what are the things that we can do to provide certainty and reduce risk? I forget who it was who said every piece of risk and every piece of time we put into a project, at the end of the day, the person who pays for that is the resident. Um, and taking that piece to heart and saying we've got to look at everything we do and figure out how we drive that cost out um, and at the same time make sure that benefit does indeed accrue to the, to the resident is something we're going to look at and zoning is a piece of that. So Monday. <laughs> So just just to relate so, some practical experience with that, that that has to start with a community conversation, and and so it's not necessarily as quick as probably the city side wants it to be, but when you're when you're making these comprehensive changes, they they have to start by establishing a um, cu community um, understanding of what it means and how it can be aligned to meet goals. And, and absent that, that, that takes effort and work and time. And um, without that, it's not gonna happen. So that, 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 that's like the, the first key step. And so I think once you start seeing that happen, then you'll start to understand what the actual timeline is gonna be in the process. The staff can have it done in a week. It's making sure that it fits with the community. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> the mayor's right there. <laughs> so thank you. This is very exciting to hear our community talking about building inclusion and mixed income communities. And the discussion has been about the South Side, but how it could be applied throughout the whole community. So the question I have is. To really get to an inclusive community, existing landlords who own property, multifamily property throughout the whole community need to be involved in making their communities inclusive for everyone. And that's a different kind of conversation. Have you seen any examples where cities have um, helped existing landowners um, open up their doors to others? Like, are there incentives used? Is it just a policy that you require all existing multifamily owners to have, you know, 10 or 20 percent of their existing units affordable? Um, what can we do to create throughout the whole community inclusion where people really do have choice of where to live? And I guess one other thing I'd just like to say is, We've talked about the building side a lot, but ha are there um, e examples you have of what's happened in other cities where you deal with really creating people living together in a neighborhood and the inclusion and you know we're dealing with gentrification and people move in, but they don't necessarily become part of the fabric of the neighborhood, and so you have issues. So any thoughts on how you deal with the people side of building community? Um, I think we, we probably all can talk about uh, uh, inclusionary housing and, and, and gentrification. I thought we'd get the whole presentation without the G word, but look at that. We got it in there. Uh, and I'll just pick up that, and then we can have the team go uh, address it. First of all, I want to make sure we um, acknowledge our, our colleague Christopher. Uh, he did all of our graphics, and but he didn't talk. And so I want to make sure that, that uh, he's acknowledged here. You know, so all of those maps and everything that we didn't want to do, he made sure that all that got done. Um, as far as... Uh, inclusionary uh, participation uh, in Houston, just like many cities, uh, we have uh, fears and some realities about gentrification, especially of our neighborhoods that are immediately adjoining uh, the, the downtown core. What the community led in and of itself was the creation of a civic association that was led by community residents. The neighborhood Third Ward is historically African American, probably 95% uh, historically. Now it's probably down to 90 because of rising home values and those kinds of things. However, the community uh, took it upon themselves to start an effort 
the Emancipation Economic Development Council was created by the community. Uh, and what they did, they literally walked door to door to ensure they not only had the participation of existing residents, but also made sure that the new residents who were mostly white and of a different economic um, barrier, if you will, uh, knew who they were and were part of a team and said, okay, if you're in our neighborhood, this is what we're going to do. We're going to work together. And uh, then partnered with the city, the planning department, as well as uh, their council members to say, we want to be a part of all planning processes moving forward. And uh, it's been a, a very, very um, successful uh, effort uh, locally in Houston. And a, a good friend of mine, um, uh, uh, a professor in our planning department at Texas Southern University, said that uh, he can't stop uh, gentrification necessarily, but he wants to be the traffic cop. And so he wants to direct which way gentrification may or may not go in our community there in Houston. Uh, there are a number of legislative and policy things we can do, but ultimately we think that it should be a community-led effort, and if the city can augment and act as a support vehicle, uh, then you'll have a lot better and a lot more empowered uh, community moving forward. Um, it's very, very difficult with existing yes. landlords, with existing buildings to impose uh, affordability requirements. Um, and I haven't seen examples of that. But I would say two things. The opportunities come in for negotiation when there's a sales transaction potentially uh, or where there's a need for renovation, where the city's resources might be available as an incentive to uh, encourage some uh, diversity of incomes. Um, we haven't really had conversations here about the use of vouchers in this city. I don't know the local experience of landlords' willingness and ability to accept voucher holders in their apartment developments. I know a number of communities where there has been a very uh, thoughtful process to try to continue to educate landlords and also, frankly, to provide some backstop services so that, you know, if there are concerns that are raised uh, with residents, there's some backstop services. So uh, depending on how your voucher programs are um, structured here, there may be some opportunities to try to work with the uh, apartment owners to have a better use of that. Um, the other point on um, just community engagement. Um, as neighborhoods are built, it's really important to have public spaces where people literally collide with each other. They're riding bikes together, they're walking dogs together, um, and uh, certainly in our experience, it's more about uh, shared hobbies, gardening, community events, that sort of thing that really continue to create that sense of community uh, once the neighborhood uh, becomes more diverse. So those are really important to build in as part of the process. Just to, to build off of that, we've been doing a lot of work on the landlord recruitment and engagement at NLC as part of our work on veteran homelessness. And really by extension, what we have learned is the, the importance of landlord incentive funds, not just landlord mitigation funds. I think about three to five years ago, landlord mitigation funds really became a popular tool and those are funds that are used to um, uh, repair any damages done to a unit that are above and beyond the security deposit. But beyond just the mitigation, fund, it's an important mechanism uh, in terms of overall incentive funds to uh, do those types of repairs beforehand, secure a unit that is vacant while the uh, community that is uh, trying to match people uh, that need subsidies and then identify uh, available housing. The landlords that come forward and say, hey, I've got some units, they're not going to stick around and wait for the community system to identify the right person and the voucher and go through the inspection process. So using vacancy payments to, to do that as part of an incentive fund. Um, I think those are all things that we're trying to encourage communities to stand up right now. Thank you. I will break my silence then on, this, <laughs> on the issue of uh, uh, mixed uh, mixed use incomes, uh, uh, mixed communities. Uh, I think it's been said once before, but I'll say it again that uh, to obtain a diversity of incomes in any community, you needed a diversity of of different unit types. You can't have all single family homes. You can't have all apartments, and so that touches on the zoning issue because you need to have a mechanism which allows 
all types of things to, to happen. It touches on the land assemblage issue because the different size parcels allow different types of unit. It touches on the parking issue because by reducing the parking requirements, you open up the possibility for all sorts of other types of units or small units that could be tucked in in different ways. So um, all of these things interwork. So um, it's, it's a lot of policy issues, infrastructure issues, and. Uh, um, and a lot of uh, a lot of work from uh, a lot of the public officials to help make that happen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you all for all your efforts. We really appreciate it here. Um, I think Director Shoney did a reasonably good job of a answering the question of when, as good as he could. I have a quick question about where um, the the policy suggestions and all the good ideas that you've that you've talked about uh, today really could be applicable in a lot of neighborhoods that are equally challenged in, in Columbus. Is it the group's recommendation that we really focus efforts on this focus area, particularly? To start, I think, I think that the notion is that... As a t sort of a test case neighborhood right. in a sense? The, the, this is the area where maybe you give yourself permission to experiment and to learn and to figure out what might be promising as a citywide practice and what is not very effective, uh, which almost no city does, actually looks at what works and what doesn't work. So I think the idea is that this is the area that you would co-design with the residents to figure out what are the needs that are, that are trying to be met and, and how. And then, like I say, the things that work, you take on to other places, the things that, that don't go into the circular file, and you try something different. Yeah, I, I actually have a question. So, um, the one of the things that I found um, intriguing in the presentation was um, one of the recommendations was to talk about accessory dwelling units um, as a home ownership tool. Um, and we had a conversation. Uh, this is one thing I actually had a small preview on. We had a little conversation on it yesterday. I, um, it's not a concept that I think a lot of folks in Columbus really understand. So, if some of the panel would like to kind of talk about what you were talking about there, I think that'd be great. Uh, so as the, as the planning director of the city that I lived in um, or live in uh, for two mayors, one of the things I did was update the zoning code and, and allow accessory dwelling units by right. Um, but it's a, so an accessory dwelling unit is an accessory apartment of some kind. It can be attached. You know, in the basement, it can be uh, it, so included within the home. You know, in in more suburban homes, you can imagine uh, many fewer people living in a home. So, like, don't change the outside of it, but change how you you've configured the inside to now. So now two families can live there, right? Um, it might be you have a lot of garages in this neighborhood. So imagine converting a garage to an apartment or allowing a second story on the garage for it to be a a, a unit. So, you know. One of the things that uh, Columbus is not immune from is the demographic changes. Uh, baby boomers are going to live a very long time, some of them on a fixed income. Uh, and, and housing prices are going to be challenging for people who are not currently challenged by housing prices. So this gives people the ability to age in place in neighborhoods and not have to leave the neighborhoods they love. So it, it, it's an, a, a policy that's potentially applicable everywhere. By its very nature, the smaller unit is cheaper than the larger unit. So you get that income diversity in a neighborhood that you wouldn't otherwise have. Some people are bartering services. So maybe a, 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 an elderly homeowner says, I don't really need as much rent. I could use help with taking the garbage out and maybe a little lawn care. And that would really make it possible for me to stay longer in this home and in this neighborhood despite my declining mobility. Um, it also means that uh, uh, for, this is important because we've talked about the gap. There's not enough money to meet the gap. By and large, accessory dwelling units are created on land and with financing, including home equity financing, that is otherwise not currently being used anywhere to produce housing. So it's all, both two new sources of resource that can help solve your housing problem. And I could go on. But is that enough? You know, and as, as a planning director of a city that's going through this discussion with ADUs right now, um, I would reiterate what Harriet said about the buy right. Um, we've had a, in our city, we've had an ADU ordinance for a few years now, and it just doesn't work because there are so many 
regulations that ultimately become obstacles to it. And if you want it to be a part of your housing toolbox to help address your housing needs, you have to make it easy to happen. Do you require parking for the ADU? That's one of the, th <laughs> that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out. In fact, on Tuesday, I get to have a fun conversation with my city council, which I'll just summarize has almost a, a come to Jesus talk. Um, so they understand, you know, especially in a city where, like in Salt Lake, most of our housing stock surprisingly was built prior to anyone ever owning a car. And so, and I'm sure that Columbus has a lot of that as well. And so it's very, very difficult to sometimes to actually add parking when buildings are six feet apart and there's no alley access and things like that. So. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question as part of this program, and then the panelists uh, will be able to kind of mull around and, and uh, add, chat and answer questions. So. By the way, Christopher, you're a very intelligent person. I sat with you at dinner the other night. He hasn't had a chance to talk very much, but <laughs> I say I greatly appreciated it. Um, construction inflation, uh, it's one of the things we're seeing now. Um, there's only so many levers as developers that we can pull to depress rent rates or keep them down for affordable housing. Um, as interest rate inflation is starting to hit right now, we're starting to see it in some of our perm financing, uh, construction inflation is the opposite end of the spectrum that is creating a pinch now. The only lever we have are rent rates. Um, Obviously, there, there are different debt packages that we can do for bonds and things like that to help with interest, but as far as uh, workforce housing development, I know we touched on that. Has anyone seen a model that can pinpoint vocational development towards construction for a specific market area? Because some of the workforce issues in this specific area, I own a construction company um, as part of our development firm, and we could see we have the need for skilled and unskilled labor. So the issue that we see is not a general contractor construction inflation number, it's a subcontractor construction inflation issue. What's happening in your community is happening all over the country. And the idea that we are not um, it, um, creating a workforce of young people who are interested in learning construction trades is a, a big problem. One of the things we've done is our association of, of contractors and builders has created job fairs. Uh, both with high school level children and even middle school level children to help them uh, wrap their minds around the idea that learning these skills can provide them a job where they can be successfully employed for years. Part of this is that um, um, young people are less oriented to construction trades than in years past. And a lot of that is because they've grown up with a game controller in their hands, as a p or listening to um, music a, a, off their um, uh, some other means that just keeps them inside, so they are never exposed to those kinds of things. That's one thing. The second thing I would tell you is that the idea of building a um, labor pool is critical to keeping your costs down. And one of the great partners we've found is actually our community college system. And our community college system has been uh, very flexible in terms of finding the uh, opportunities in the job market that they can train people for. And I'll extend beyond just the construction uh, aspect of it. Um, they've trained people to be project managers. They have trained people to be um, um, more fluent in uh, real estate acquisition. They've trained them to be more fluent in uh, facilities management, just taking care of built environments. So those are two quick suggestions, both the construction uh, trades, kind of sponsoring activities with young people, and community college providing workforce development in some areas of the workforce where you're finding shortages of trained employees. Uh, 
about the immediate workforce? Sorry about that. What about the immediate workforce in this specific area working on specific projects like workforce credits? Because that's what I'm saying. I think we all know we're, the city's doing a fantastic job in creating a, an environment for growth of these skill sets over time. But we're seeing it now. And if there's any way that our subcontractors can locate labor that's willing to step on the job site, it helps with the transit issue of construction also. Because I hear all the time, we own some parking assets downtown. I have contractors calling constantly, can we get parking? Can we get parking? Can we get parking? And I could see this be an issue uh, even over there in that, that district. So, um, I just sort of building on the, the thoughts here and just to give some examples, there is a community housing partners in Virginia is a, a group that did a lot on green jobs and really focused on apprenticeships and then building people to a higher skill level, um, preparing them. So during that apprenticeship program and the skills building program, using them on their projects, but then actually creating a workforce and a a, a group of skills, skilled uh, people who were then able to move and work on other projects, and it's it that's worked very well. Um, that's more on the green jobs, um, sort of looking very focused on, you know, meeting all the requirements and understanding how to do the the, act, the envelope pieces and blower door tests, and all those different pieces. Um, then there's also um, in Washington D.C. We, we have a program. Where it focuses more on linking the restrictions of around the affordability and the gap financing, linking that to first source and really pushing uh, developers. When we do projects there, we actually have to, we have requirements around hiring people in the local area. And then the job fairs and things like that, we do that very intentionally. Then we match up with apprenticeship programs. So um, there's great examples there. Uh, the Catholic Charities there has a program like that. And then one last example in Baltimore, uh, there's a build, a group called Build There that actually works on smaller, smaller scale projects. And they've worked on capacity building with contractors in the neighborhood and the skilled for the force in workforce in the neighborhood. And over time, that's created um, an ongoing labor force that they can tap into and they work with. So just three examples. Quick, one. No, go ahead. Quick comment, if, if, you, if you're looking for immediate results, I, I, I know that Reverend Edgar has got a first class coming out and in placement into the hospital, and I think you have a near-term opportunity there. Your point about escalating construction costs and downward pressure on assets and really that pinch that you're experiencing, that's across the country. I also, I, I believe, picked up on that the mayor was talking about some sort of an apprenticeship program. So I think you have focus there, and I think you have opportunity with, with community partners. Um, to add on to that, there are two suggestions I want to make. One, it requires uh, not only to, the real estate industry to look at non-traditional uh, stakeholders. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, churches in the community and other organizations who actually may have homegrown uh, skill sets. You know, I, for one, come from a small town. We always had someone in our church who fixed on things and repair things. And there's those, oftentimes those entities are not connected to this conversation. That's one of the reasons why we made the recommendation earlier to organize those assets uh, where we, you can actually tap into. Second, um, I think there is something I don't want to gloss over. One of the beauties about this study area is the fact of scale. It is small scale. And of course, I, just having the previous conversation earlier, it seems to appear that you're more of a mid-sized, larger scale developer. But what this study area allows is that you have small scale where right now we have this conversation about the eviction uh, where it's very resonant uh, driven where a code enforcement comes in, I want to fix my house, but I'm scared. One of the things is that if the city fixed that, but also turned the paradigm on its head, instead of having the residents go to the city to have some come, why not enable the real estate community to actually say, we're going to create a, as part of our apprenticeship program, bring high school students, middle class students, incarcerated into a program where they become basically your salesman to go to these homes, they're trained, and say, hey, grandmother, your house needs fixed. I am certified by the city. We're going to bring a loan to you. So you actually now have literally 10,000 units where people can get immediate training on how to do uh, contracting, carpentry work, and site development with a partnership with you, where now you've created an ecosystem of workers who 
who can now work on larger scale projects. And I think it's those type of innovations that these are individuals who know the neighbors, who can actually go and say, hey, I got trained, I can now use my skill set and help my grandmother's house or help my next door neighbor and I can make money for myself. At the same time, you have the ability to identify workers who can work on your larger projects. It's those innovative collaborations which requires all of us, which one again, all of us to sit around a table to deploy the resources that we have and leverage them, because you have them. Yeah, I, I think that what we're hearing is is that this is a problem that's nationwide. Houston being one of the fastest growing cities in this country, we're dealing with it. I've done some construction uh, management in our city. Uh, we are very well aware of it. What Houston put in place, and I think you heard a, a host of near-term and long-term solutions. What Houston put in place uh, was a couple of levers. When you're getting pinched on your quite frankly by your subs, you have to try to find other ways to save money. In addition to using uh, the policies you heard here, uh, what Houston put in place was something called Hire Houston First. So you're able to, you would receive credits on some of your permitting if you use people from the direct neighborhood. And then it went, the, the ratio went higher if you use people closer and closer to the job site, right? So if you use somebody from the next town, then it would be X. If you use people that are from the next block, then it will be Y. So that was able to save money in a different capacity of your project. Additionally, uh, you were able to expedite your permitting. So as we all know, that could have a tremendous cost at the end if you're getting your permits in a week as opposed to four, right, or whatever the case may be. So, uh, <laughs> so there are definitely some levers there that you can use, and you can use those kinds of things can have an immediate uh, impact on your project that you're doing right now. Uh, one of the things that I think it's important, you heard the job training opportunities. We want to make sure that we can probably all talk to you more about that offline, because I think those are things that you can use for the neighborhood directly. Uh, but with that, we want to again thank our team. We want to be able to transition because we know people have to leave and instead of trying to tiptoe out, you can now all leave en masse if you want to. But uh, we will all be here to address any and all questions that you have and we want to thank you all for your time and your hospitality this entire week. And, <laughs> yeah, no. and just, to, just to let everyone know that um, Mark Trevillis at the Planning Division has set up a, uh, on the Planning Division's page of the uh, Department of Development website has a link set up for this project. There's some resources there. He will be adding a P this presentation, the PDF of that as well. Just give him a little time to. Do you have a desk yet? You, yeah, you, no, you don't have a desk yet. So maybe Monday, maybe give him till Monday to do it. But it'll be there for you guys as well. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm good. You're good. Okay.